ಪ್ರೀತಿ ತೊರೆಯುವ ನಾವು ಪರೀಕ್ಷೆ ಬರೆಯುವ ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ ವಾಣಿಯ ನಾವು ನೋಡಿ ಕಲಿಯುವ ಅಂಕಗಳೆಂದರೆ ಮೇಲಿನ ತೊಗಟೆ ವಿದ್ಯೆ ಅದರ ಒಳಗಿನ ತಿರುಳು ಭೀತಿ ತೊರೆಯುವ ನಾವು ಪರೀಕ್ಷೆ ಬರೆಯುವ ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ ವಾಣಿಯ ನಾವು ನೋಡಿ ಕಲಿಯುವ ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ ವಾಣಿಯ ನಾವು ನೋಡಿ ಕಲಿಯುವ ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ ವಾಣಿಯ ನಾವು ನೋಡಿ ಕಲಿಯುವ Good morning students and welcome to Parikshewani. Today I am here to analyze two prose pieces and two poem pieces. The first prose that we will be analyzing is what is moral action, the eyes are not here, a poison tree and sonnet 73. Let's start with the first prose. What is moral action by M. K. Gandhi? Children, I am sure everybody knows who this great person is. He is one of the greatest men of all times. He is none other than Mohandas Karamchandra Gandhi. He is one of the contemporary Indians. His method of non-violence and truth has won freedom for all without bloodshed. He has proved to the world that love is more powerful than nuclear weapons. Let's see the summary of the lesson. This lesson presents a brief discussion of what moral action means. Children, I'm sure you know what moral action is. Any good deed is known as a moral action. But then, Moral action also has got its own criteria. We will learn about it in this lesson. All our daily actions need not be considered moral. See from the time you get up in the morning, all the actions that we do, it's not necessarily moral. Most of our actions are done according to the prevailing conventions. We are just doing it for the sake of doing it. And why we are doing it? Because if we don't do it, we will get into trouble. It is done to prevent anarchy and encourage social intervention. Now let's see the criteria of moral action. A moral act must be our own act. It must spring from our own will. Children, whatever we do, it should come from within us. Nobody should force you, nobody should compel you to do it. And when there is a compulsion, it becomes a mechanical act. Mechanical act does not have moral content in it. See, we know that you have to, you know that you have to do your homework. It should come from within you. It should come from within you that you have to sit for your studies, jot down the points and work hard. But when if somebody has to remind you to do it, somebody has to force you to do it, it becomes a mechanical act. In this lesson, we have the example of the king and his messenger. The king has the morality to forgive his culprit. The king has ordered the messenger to carry the order of pardon to the culprit. Now, if the messenger carries the order in a mechanical manner, it doesn't become a moral act. But if he does it thinking it is his duty, definitely it becomes a moral act. Moral act sh should have a good intention. A good act can be moral only if the intention is good. You may do good job, but if intention is bad, it does not become a moral act. For example, 
if you help your friend in his studies but you expect something you're doing a good job of helping your friend but then you're expecting something this does not become a moral act a moral act your intention should be good feeding the poor in this lesson we have seen two people feeding the poor one person feeds the poor out of pity the other person feeds the poor just to gain prestige now can you tell me whose action can be called a moral action definitely the person who feeds the poor out of pity and not for any prestige or fame the next example alexander the great historians call this emperor great just because he has done many conquest and has very famous throughout his conquest he has carried greek language greek culture arts and manners and that's why today we enjoy the greek civilization he can be called great because he has conquered many kingdoms but his action cannot be called moral why because his intention was just to be a great conqueror and become famous now a moral action should be done without in fear and without any compulsion for example waking up early in the morning we wake up early in the morning thinking that we should go to school on time second example is about simple living third is about high salary rising early for the fear of reaching late to school or office so you get up early in the morning because you want to reach the school on time it is a good act it is nice to be punctual but it should not it should not be done just because you are afraid that if you don't reach the school on time you will be punished you can reach the school early just to cultivate the habit of punctuality the second example simple living simple living is just because if you lead a simple life just to help your fellow men then it becomes a moral act but if you are wealthy and you still decide to li live a simple life thinking of the miseries of the world then your action definitely becomes a moral action because you do not want to live a luxurious life even though you can now let's see the next example an employer paying high salary lest they leave him an employer giving good salary a good hike in their salary is definitely good a good action but if he has the intention that i should give him good salary or else he leave me and go then his good action does not become a moral action why because he is just doing it for his own personal benefit instead if he gives good hike to his employer wishing him well and treating him kindly and realizing that today he is earning the prosperity just because of his workers then the action becomes a moral action one more example king richard ii when the farmers rose to revolt they went to him demanding their rights king richard ii granted the rights but once the danger was over he forced them to surrender their rights though he had granted the rights under his own seal and signature but he forced them to surrender their rights once the danger was over this is definitely not a moral action because 
he had done it out of fear. He had granted them their rights just because he was afraid that they would rise in revolt. Now, moral action should not have any self-interest. Whatever we do children, we should do it from our own will. We should not expect anything. It should not be for our self-interest. Shakespeare has quoted, love born out of profit motive is no love. You cannot love a person thinking that you will get something from him. If that is your intention, then it is not a true love. Now, don't seek comfort in another world. Let us not do anything just because we want to have a good life in the other world. For example, Saint Francis Saviour, he prayed passionately. He prayed to God to give him a pure heart and soul. He also prayed because it's man's duty to pray. Now let's see the great personality Mother Teresa. What she has to tell us about moral action. She wished to have a torch in her right hand and a vessel of water in her left hand. With the torch she wants to burn the glories of heaven and with the vessel of water she wanted to extinguish the fires of hell. She wants all of us to love and serve God without the fear of hell and the temptation of heaven. Let's do a moral action without expecting anything. Now, to preserve morality, definitely it demands a brave heart. It demands a brave heart that can cost your life also. It is cowardice to be true to friends and break faith with enemies. If you are a true friend, you need to love your friend as well as your enemies. Now, Henry Clay, another great personality known for his kindliness. What he did was he sacrificed his beliefs, his principles just to gain, um, to be ambitious. Henry Clay, known for his kindliness, he sacrificed his convictions or his principles just to be ambitious. Daniel Webster, another great intellect and a hero, he sold his intellectual integrity for a price. He put a price tag on his soul. We can never know what a man's action is, whether it is a moral action or a non-moral action. It is difficult to judge the morality of a man's action. Why? Because we cannot penetrate the depth of his mind. By now, I am sure children, you have understood what is a moral action, what is a non-moral action and you know what what is the criteria of moral actions? Moral action should be something that comes out from within you. It should be done without any fear or compulsion. Yeah. Now let's discuss the most likely questions. Why does Gandhi say that a moral action should be done without compulsion? You know the answer children. It should be done without compulsion because it should come from within you. When does an employee's action of paying the employees remain non-moral? When he pays his employees money thinking that they should have, they should be treated well and they should have a good life. Now, what is the difference between mechanical act and an intentional act? Yeah, now you know what is a mechanical act when a mechanical act does not come from within you. It just you're doing it for the sake of doing it. An intentional act is something that comes within you. Students, now let's get to the next poem. The next poem is A Poison Tree by William Blake. William Blake belonged to the pre-romantic period. He did not have any formal education. He is called a mystic poet. Why? because he had the ability to see the world of God behind the physical world surrounding us. Now let's see the summary of this poem. Blake's 
books are divided into two songs of innocence and songs of experience these two show the two opposite states of a human soul songs of innocence by the name itself it has themes which are very innocent like children lamb etc songs of experience tends to be little darker now the poison tree is taken from the book songs of experience the poison tree it is about anger revenge and death now anger is a emotion which is there in everybody it is an aggressive emotion an emotion which is not only seen in human beings it is also seen in animals we have seen the animals fighting venting out their anger now all of us get angry sometimes now how do you vent out your anger different people have different way of venting out their anger some shout some bang their fist some just walk out of the situation it's always good to vent out our anger now the theme here the poison tree which tells us about anger revenge and death it uses metaphors it uses the garden the tree and apple as metaphors that elude the garden of eden with adam and eve and the tree of knowledge with its forbidden apple the poem is basically about the consequences of hatred see when you get angry you start hating somebody so this poem tells us that if you keep your hatred what will be the consequences in the first situation we can see that the poet is angry with his friend but since it is his own friend he feels comfortable with him he tells his anger to him he expresses his anger he tells him see i don't like the way you behaved with me or i don't like the way you talked to me i'm very angry with you so please don't behave in such a manner he has told his anger so what happens is within no time the conflict is resolved there is no hidden anger he does not carry his hatred he does not carry the anger but in the second scenario the speaker is angry with his foe or his enemy now since he it is not his friend he is not very comfortable with him what does he do he just bottle bottles up his feelings he does not express his anger to him he just keeps it to himself once when we bottle up our anger and do not express it turns into an hatred it turns into hatred and this hatred builds up it builds up to such an extent that you want to take revenge and it builds up to become an apple it becomes an apple in this poem an apple is something which looks very beautiful very attractive fruit something which looks beautiful but can be poisonous and full of venom inside the second stanza is an extended metaphor metaphor is a comparison of two things without the use of as or like it is an unclear comparison now in the second stanza the anger is compared to a poison tree because he did not tell the anger to his enemy it has grown it has grown into a hatred and now it is definitely go- going to grow into a poison tree the poet starts nurturing his anger and how he nurtures his anger which gives way to a poison tree is he starts watering the tree as tree needs water sunlight to grow he starts watering his anger 
which gives rise to the poison tree. He waters the budding tree with fears and tears all day and night. The poet uses his smiles as if to give sunlight to nurture the tree. The poet does not show his enemy that he is angry, but at the same time he is very deceitful. He, he just smiles as if to say that he is happy with his enemy, but actually he is not happy with his enemy and his hatred has grown towards him. In the third stanza, we can see that the poison tree is getting, uh, getting nurtured. Finally, the tree bears the fruit, the fruit of the poet's anger in the form of a beautiful appealing apple. This is again similar to the biblical forbidden tree. Now, in the Bible, we can see that Adam and Eve, they were tempted to eat the apple and once they ate the apple, they had sinned. In the same way, the foe was so tempted towards this apple. What he did was, he went into the poet's garden. He knew that it was the poet's. So, he went into the poet's ga garden, he consumed the apple and we will see what the result was. The last stanza, it brings the anger to an end. The foe consumed the apple and he was fallen dead. The narrator had lost its, his humanity. He, he went below his dignity. He did not mind killing a person and this all happened just because he got angry with him, he did not tell it out and his anger grew into a hatred and finally vengeance. He is glad that his enemy is dead. Just imagine a man feeling very happy on the death of another man. So anger can take you to any extent my dear children. So whenever we are angry, it is always better to vent it out, to tell it out. You are angry with somebody, tell him that you are angry and the conflict gets solved. The poisonous apple lured the enemy into the garden. The poisonous apple, the attractive apple, it attracted the enemy into the garden. He went to the poet's garden, consumed the apple, apple and he was dead. The last two lines or the last couplet indicates that the poet felt solace in the death of his foe. See children, this poem is for memorization and this poem is a food for thought that anger, though it is an emotion in everybody, but let us never har harbor anger or grudge. We should try to resolve the conflicts immediately. Resolving the conflicts, communication is the best way. Communication is the best way because whenever you are angry with somebody, tell it out. You don't lose anything. But if you don't tell it out, what happens is your anger turns to hatred, then to vengeance and then it can also kill your enemy. So communication is the best way to avoid the fruit of the poison tree. I am sure children you have understood the main theme of the poem. Now, this poem is there for you to memorize. Now, let us revise some of the questions. These are some of the most likely questions. How does the poet use the image of a tree to bring out the destructive effect of suppressed anger? Since he suppressed his ang anger, it turned out into hatred and it gave rise to the poisonous tree. If he had expressed his anger, the problem would have been solved. Next question. What happened when the speaker expressed his anger and when he suppressed it? Already discussed, when he expressed his anger, the conflict was resolved, there was no hidden anger. 
when he suppressed it or when he bottled it up that is what gave rise to hatred and finally the poison tree. Now what was the result of the two instances? Yeah, there is one more question and into my garden stole when the night had veiled the pool. This questions can come for three marks. Who stole into the garden? Why did he steal into the garden? And explain the phrase veiled the pool. Dear students, now let us start with Pro 6, The Eyes Are Not Here by Ruskin Bond. Ruskin Bond was born in Kasoli in 1934. He has written several novels, short stories and books for children. When he was just 17 years old, he wrote The Room on the Roof. His stories are based on Masuri in the foothills of Himalayas where he lives. Now, let us go to the summary of the story. This story has got two main characters, a blind man and a blind girl. They are travelling by train. The author Ruskin Bond plays the role of the narrator in the persona of the blind young man. The narrator says that he was totally blind at the time. He was able to see light and dark and so he could not tell what the girl looked like. The blind man was travelling in the train and the blind girl also got into the train. He wanted to know more about this blind girl. He wanted to know how she looked. He very much liked her voice. She had come with her parents, most probably parents or some relatives because when she got into the train, they advised her. They told her not to lean on the window, not to talk to strangers and these are some of the directions given to her by her relatives or parents. Our author, he liked her voice. His voice startled her when he asked her, are you also going to Dehra? Our author was going to Dehra. So he said, are you, he asked her, are you also going to Dehra? His voice startled her. She said, Oh, I didn't know that there was somebody in the compartment. So our author says, he attributes to this to her good sight. He says that sighted people miss a lot of things because there is so much for them to see. He talks to the girl as if to say that the girl had a very good sight. Only later, the irony of the statement will be made clear. The blind man. He wanted to conceal his blindness. Throughout the journey, he tried his best not to let the girl know that he was blind. He started talking to her just like any other normal human being who has good eyesight. This girl also started conversing with him. He gave a vivid description of Masuri. He started talking. He started talking to this girl. He spoke so much just to conceal his blindness. He didn't want her to know that he is blind. He started describing Masuri. He said, Masuri is a very beautiful place. The hills are covered with wild dahlias. The sun is delicious. And at night, people can sit in front of log fire and listen to some music. He is curious to know about this girl's look. Though he is unable to see, see, but he wants to know how this girl looks. Most probably he will never be able to know the looks of this girl. But he becomes very daring. He says, you have an interesting face. He is very careful in saying, he never said you have a pretty face or a beautiful face. But he uses a very safe adjective. He says, you have an interesting face. If she, if he had to say you have a beautiful face and if this girl is not that beautiful, she can always ask him, 
how can you tell me i have a beautiful face don't you have eyes on your face so he was very daring at the same time he was cautious he made he made a very good statement he used the right adjective there he said you have an interesting face the girl said it's so nice to listen to this always people have said i have got a pretty face and you are the only one who says i have got an interesting face our author he wanted to know about her more he wanted to know whether her hair was long how she had tied her hair whether it was she had worn a bun or left her hair loose during the journey both of them started talking they started talking about the scenery outside the window after some time it was already time for the girl to get down during their journey together both of them maintained a very good relationship both of them started talking they started talking about themselves they started talking about the scenery outside the window now after she got down he wanted to know more about her he came to know that she ha- it is time for her to get down and he want he came he wanted to touch her he wanted to touch her hair and see as he came closer to her he could get the perfume of her hair the perfume of, of her hair was very tantalizing as the girl got down on her station there was an other co-passenger who got onto the train the narrator once again wanted to play his game with this new fellow traveler what was the game that he was playing the game that he played with a girl was that he just pretended that he had a very good eyesight throughout the journey he maintained he kept it hidden from her that he is blind he did not want her to know that he is blind now he decided that he is going to play the same game with this new fellow traveler as the new traveler got onto the compartment the narrator asked him whether the girl had long or short hair the traveler tells him that he noticed her eyes not her hair finally he remarks saying that she had beautiful eyes but they were of no use because she was blind see dear children we have seen that both of them are blind the girl is blind the man is also blind but both played their role their best they did not reveal to each other that they were blind now these are some of the most likely questions let's discuss some of the most likely questions give instances to show that the narrator tried his best to impress on her that he could see during his encounter with the girl describe musuri now the story ends with a revelation what is the revelation what does the story reveal in the end i'm sure children you know what it is isn't it the story reveals that both the both the characters that is the blind man and the girl both were blind and till the end they played their role well the next question is what again once again i had a game to play with a new fellow traveler now what kind of game does the speaker play with his fellow traveler what is that game i know i'm sure you know the answer the game that the traveler played with the girl was that he concealed his blindness and the same thing he is going to play with a new fellow traveler now what do you understand from this about his attitude who had outwitted whom in the game already played by the narrator yeah. who had outwitted whom can you tell that was the blind man or the girl did the blind man play his game properly or did the girl yeah we can conclude saying that both of them played their parts well but definitely it was a girl who outwitted the blind man 
dear children let's move on to the next poem that is poem 6 that time of year or sonnet 73 that time of year by william shakespeare william shakespeare does not need any introduction he is the greatest english dramatist playwright and a poet his famous works all of you know there are many but we have listed few here his main works are julius caesar merchant of venice romeo and juliet he has composed 154 sonnets out of which 126 is dedicated to mr w h this Mr. W. H. is his friend. Now let's see what is the summary of the poem. Now this sonnet 73 talks about the growing pensiveness of old age. The poet is feeling bad about his old age. He is talking to his friend. He has written this poem for his friend Mr. W. H. The speaker uses a sequence of metaphors to portray the nature which he compares to his old age. It is very clear that he did not like old age. Clearly shows his distaste for death but highlights that growing old and death is inevitable. This poem deals with the pensiveness of old age. This poem is divided into three quatrains. In the first quatrain, the poet compares his old age to autumn and winter. He uses nature and time to compare his old age. In the first quatrain, he compares his old age to autumn and winter. He tells his friend that his age is like a time of the year. Time of the year, the season of the years. First, he says his old age is compared to autumn. Autumn has all the characteristics of the leaves falling, turning yellow and then falling down, the weather becomes cold and the birds have left the branches. The birds have left the branches because there are no leaves. The leaves have fallen, there is nothing. They cannot nest there, they cannot have the fruits of the tree and that is why they have left the branches. The leaves falling and the leafless branches where the birds do not stay anymore. This signifies the harshness and emptiness of old age. This also highlights the severity and the unimportance of old age. When people become old, they are not taken care well. They are not shown any importance. Just like the birds leave the branches, people leave the old people. They are not cared. In the second quatrain, the metaphor shifts to that of twilight. Twilight is a part of the day when the, when the sun sets. It is just evening but the light is still there. It has not become very dark. So it is, it emphasizes the gradual fading of light of youth. He is talking about his youth here. He says his youth is like a twilight. The fading of the light, the, when the sun sets, the light gets faded and it fades to a black night. The black night here refers to night, saying the fading light is taken away, it is taken by the night. The poet here again compares his age to twilight, which after sunset, the remaining light is also slowly getting extinguished by darkness. When it becomes dark, 
he refers to death's second self. He says darkness always refers to death. It signifies that death brings eternal rest. The poet here stresses on the metaphor of season and day. See children, season and day are cycl cyclic. After summer, it is winter, then rainy and you know there is a cycle, spring, autumn, there is a cycle in the season. Even the day, day is cyclic. It is day, afternoon, evening, night. Next day again you have the same morning, afternoon, evening, night. But that is not with old age. That is not with the time, with the life of a person. Old age is going to be the final for, an, for a person. In the third quatrain, the speaker finally resigns himself to the fact, to the fact that he is old and he has to resign to it. Now, he compares his old age to the glowing fire. He is comparing his old age to the glowing fire which lies on the ashes of his youth, which lies on the ashes of the youth which once enabled him to burn. Now, this glowing fire is going to be soon consumed by that which it was once nourished by. The couplet, the couplet of the sonnet. Now, the last two lines of the sonnet, it renews the speaker's plea for the young man's love. He is telling his friend, he is pleading his friend, urging him to love well, saying that, we must love well because we are going to leave each other very soon. It also throws light on human nature. So it's very common for we people to desire something passionately when we know that we are going to lose it. So when you have something, we do not value them. But when you know that you have lost it or you are going to lose it, you show so much of value to it. So the poet is asking his friend, he is pleading to his friend that he needs to love, he needs to love well because people will leave each other very soon. Now children, by this poem you have come to know that man's life is not cyclic, man has to die. Though he compares with the season and with the day, but he knows finally he resigns to the fact that he is old and he is going to die. So before he dies, he just wants his friend, he pleads his friend to understand that while we are alive, while we are alive, we need to love each other well, we need to live a good life. Now let us revise some of the most likely questions. How is the couplet a fitting conclusion to the three quatrains? Bare ruined choirs where late the sweet bird sang has a double image. Explain what the poet wants his friend to behold. Now, bare ruined choirs where, the la where late the sweet bird sang. Bare ruined choirs refer to the grumbling church, trees empty of birds or both. Now, why has the sound disappeared? You may be knowing the answer children, why has the sound disappeared? The sound of the birds, the singing of the birds, it has disappeared because the birds have left the branches, they have gone somewhere else because the branches are leafless. Why the poet has used the word late? Here the word late refers to recently. Of late the birds used to sing, but now they are not singing. Why are the branches of the leaves, trees leafless? Why it is leafless? What is the season? The season mentioned is autumn. So autumn is a season where the trees lose their leaves and therefore the branches of the trees are leafless. Yes children, by now you have understood the lessons that I have already done, the two prose and the two poems. 
I wish you all the best dear children. Jot on all the points and keep studying and definitely hard work will always give you the fruit. I wish you all the best. Do well in your exams. Thank you for listening my class. Good morning everyone. Welcome to Parikshavani. Myself Divya. Today I am here to revise two lessons and one poem from first language English. Okay. From prose I have chosen prose number 7 the girl who was Anne Frank and prose number 8 a village cricket match and from poetry I have taken poem number 7 the stolen boat okay now let us see the prose number seven the girl who was Anne Frank yeah now you can see the picture she is only Anne Frank okay she ended up her life at the age of 16 years okay so so early she ended up her life what was the reason what might be the reason behind that let us see when we are uh, revising this lesson we will come to no okay fine the highlights of this lesson opinion of a professor about the human race obviously if we want to know about Anne Frank we want to know about Hitler also and Anne Frank's family members emigration of Anne's family Annie and Margot, Fa Frank's family went into hiding, songbird in hiding, people of annex arrested, Annie as a courageous leader, Otto Frank's mission in life, success story of Annie's diary and mass appeal. These are the things which we will cover in today's re recapitulation part Okay, from this lesson. The lesson starts with the opinion of the professor about the human race. An argumentative young student once asked, uh, asked his professor how did he knew that the human race is worth saving. Okay, The professor will give a simple answer that he read Annie Frank's diary. A very good example professor gave to his student. Clear? Fine. If you want to know about Annie Frank, first we must know about Adolf Hitler. Clear? He was a German politician and leader of the Nazi party. He aimed to eliminate Jews from Germany as he thought they were an inferior race 
an alien threat to german racial purity and community okay that was his aim in his life yeah here goes adolf hitler picture how he was cruel to jews we, we will come to know when we read this lesson okay anne frank's family members let us see anne's father name was otto frank he was a banker from germany anne's mother was edith frank and anne had one elder sister her name was margot emigration of anne's family in 1933 when hitler was issuing one anti jewish decree that means order okay after another otto frank decided to emigrate to netherland emigrate means to leave one's own country permanently he started small firm partnership with mr van dan in amsterdam they traded in spices otto frank as well as mr van dan started a business in amsterdam clear students fine anne and margot how they were having their own uh, unique qualities most people believed with their parents that margot was promising child okay so most of the people were believing that margot would uh, fulfill her parents dream she was working out for that but on other hand anne was very emotional strong willed a real problem child a great talker and fond of nice clothes these are the unique qualities of anne and margot frank's family went into hiding why did they go into hiding let us see now when the nazis invaded the netherlands in 1940 the franks were trapped thus otto frank realized that the time might come he and his family would have to go into hiding to save their lives clear students fine the time was not so far as in 1942 margot frank was called up for deportation write down the meaning for this word students deportation means to th there was an order for uh, anne frank to leave the country she was staying in netherland yes or no netherland government gave an order that she need to leave the country clear but she didn't go what did they do straight away the franks family moved into the annex instead margot leaving the country franks family moved into the annex to save their lives clear okay franks family four members Van Den's family, three members, and a dentist moved into their hiding place. Totally, eight members went into hiding place. That was in annex. Otto Frank's staff brought food, magazines, and books. The only link with the outside was provided by the. radio so who were helping them means it was uh, otto frank staff who were helping them to get food magazines and books and they had radio to get connected with the outer world as if they need to get the news what was happening outside clear students fine song bird and hiding so anne was at that time anne was just a young adolescent girl okay so when she was been locked in a room so how how did she feel what were her feelings emotions everything will we will get to know through our diary while in hiding anne decided to continue a diary which her parents had given her on her 13th birthday clear she described life in the annex with all its inevitable tensions and 
quarrels so in her diary in her own autobiography anna had mentioned how much tensions as well as how much they need to quarrel because they had very small rooms in the uh, annex okay so all those anna had mentioned in a diary a diary reveals a complete record of adolescents that engage or teenage sketched with complete honesty of a young girl's thoughts and feelings are longing and loneliness so everything has been mentioned without she didn't hide anything so everything has been mentioned in the diary she felt like a songbird whose wings had been brutally torn out and who was flying in utter darkness against the bars of its own cage students kindly understand this so a bird has been locked down in the cage before that if the bird uh, wings had been cut off okay torn out so what would happen the bird would be moving and getting still more hurt by flying in utter darkness against the bars of its own cage people of annexed were arrested on august 4th 1944 all the members who were hidden in the annex were arrested somehow nazis got the information and they were arrested later nazi separated otto frank from his wife and daughters they were taken to auschwitz auschwitz is in poland okay on the way mrs frank van den and the dentist lost their lives from exhaustion exhaustion here means due to tiredness clear so they died on their where who mrs frank van den and the dentist lost their lives ani as a courageous leader now she ani had lost her mother so how did she behave in the camp ani proved to be her courageous leader of her small ostrich group when there was not thing to heat she dared to go to the kitchen to ask for food she was boldly entering to the kitchen and she was ordering she was demanding for the food she constantly told margot never to give in that means never to accept the defeat so in this way we can say that anne was a courageous leader once any passed hundreds of hungarian jewish children who were standing naked in freezing rain waiting to be led to the gas chambers students note down the point gas chambers why so the kids the people from the jewish community when they were alive hitler was commanding them to sent to the gas chambers and burned them alive this was the order given got it so that's why the small kids were standing in those freezing rain nakedly waiting for the chance to go in sir to to be led to the gas chambers unable to grasp the horrors inflicted upon them in the world of adults she couldn't bear so being the elders they are only doing such a cruel uh, they are only behaving in a such a cruel manner so she couldn't believe it clear okay later anne and her sister were transported to belsen and he died in march 1945 due to typhoid a few days after margot even margot died there both were buried in a mass grave only otto frank stayed alive mrs frank died 
even Anne Frank died as well as Margot also died. So, among Otto Frank's family only Otto Frank stayed alive. Clear? Fine. Otto Frank's mission in life. So, when Otto Frank came back to Netherland, okay. So, Meep, one of his typists, his staff had hand over Anne's diary to Otto Frank. Otto Frank took many weeks to finish reading and broke down after every few pages. As and then Otto Frank was reading, okay. He was broke down, collapsed, okay. Missing his own, missing his child. Otto Frank's friends urged him to publish an S diary. Otto Frank did not have idea okay, that he need to publish diary. His friends told him to publish an S diary. So, that became the mission in Otto Frank's life. Success story of an S diary. The diary was first published in Dutch. Later, millions of editions were sold in Britain, Japan and United States. So many letters poured to Otto Frank in reply. The great success was the diary was sold in Germany also. So, this can be uh, said as a success story of Anne's diary. When the play opened in seven German cities, no one knew how the audience would react. After the publication of the diary, this has been uh, made into a play. When the play opened in seven German cities, no one knew how the audience would react. No Nazis were seen on the stage, but their threatening presence were felt. So, Nazis were not seen on the stage, but their presence were felt by each and every audience. Packed audience received Anne's tragedy in a remorse, in a shame. Okay, In Germany, people received a tragedy in a shame and they were not ready to go outside during the interval also as they were shamed to face the light. Clear students? Fine. Germany's post-war administrators toiled to make people feel the senseless and criminal nature of the Nazi rule. How uh, cruel were Nazis? So, this uh, was taken by Germany's post-war administrators. But on the whole, they failed. But the diary of Anne Frank succeeded. What Germany's uh, post-war administrators could not do, Anne's, uh, Anne Frank's diary did and it succeeded. Anne's brief life is indeed only a beginning. She carries the message of courage and tolerance all over the world. She lives even after her death. Okay, now let us see most frequently asked questions from this lesson. What impression did people have about Anne? Why did Otto Frank emigrate to Netherlands? What finally forced Frank to go into hiding? How did Anne compare herself to her song Bird? Why does the writer call Anne a courageous leader. What became the mission of Mr. Frank's life? How did the diary of Anne Frank succeed where German administrators had failed? These are the most frequently asked questions. Hope you people understood this lesson. Now, let me move to the next lesson. Lesson number 8. A village cricket match. Hope everyone will like this lesson because cricket is a favorite game for many students. Clear. 
let me start this lesson okay the eyelids uh, which we are going to revise from this lesson first we must know names of the two teams which were playing in this lesson and the players names are uh, yes very much important what were the humorous situations uh, jot down by the uh, author ag macdonald uncertainty and disorganization among the rank of invaders all this we are going to revise from this lesson now first let us see the name of the two teams who played in this lesson scottish and english team okay now let us see the fielders name scottish team players name were livingstone mr shakespeare pulak south court mr orge he was the captain of the scottish team a youth in the blue jumper his name has not been given the author is describing him like a youth in the blue jumper the major mr ogilvy boon donald wicket keeper professor of ballistics these are the players from the uh, scottish team now let us see the players from uh, english team mr arcot he was the sexton the postman his name was joe the blacksmith was bell the baker he was a runner okay now the play starts the author when he starts the story he is saying that it, it was a critical situation raised in the match okay when there was a critical situation okay very interesting we say no at that time he started writing this story clear thus all the fieldsmen drew nearer and nearer to the batsman except the youth in the blue jumper so the match was in a critical situation means there was a pos positivity both for the batting as well as fielding team to win the match so what this uh, fieldsman did, did all drew nearer and nearer to the batsman except the youth in the blue jumper the batting team needed just 6 runs to win and they had 3 wickets in and yes or no really it is a critical situation we can say so both the teams had the uh, positivity to win the match a snake through the slip brought a single here it is a figure of speech which you people must note down what is that that is alliteration it is a repeated sound sir you can hear a snake through the slip brought a single clear students so when the play started the team needed just six runs but a snake through the slip they got one more run 6 minus 1 they needed just five runs later batting team got a run through a bye okay so 6 minus 2 it is four runs required okay the batting team got one more run through a miss hit mr pulak was excited and flung the ball madly at the wicket but it resulted in two overthrows and the batting team got two runs so mr pulak was uh, excited so as soon as he got the ball he flung the ball madly at the wicket but what was the result it resulted in two overthrows and the batting team got two runs so now let us see what was the score the scores were level and there were two wickets to fall the sexton the man of iron muscle hit the ball straight into the 
here clear students what happened the ball flashed like a thunderbolt and struck in the mid ref of the boon just like a red hot cannon ball with the sound of a drumstick so as soon as the ball flashed like a thunderbolt it it mid ref of boon and the author is comparing that small cricket ball to a red hot cannon ball okay which will be used during wars and when it it a uh, boon's mid ref or stomach it, the sound was just like a drumstick finally sexton was out but boon was angry due to the pain caused by the hit finally sexton was out but boon was not happy for catching the ball but it pained him a lot clear the scores were level and there was one wicket to fall that's why the author is saying it is a critical situation so everyone was curious what would happen hope oh, even we will be if we were in that position even we would be so much curious the last man and was the blacksmith came to the field leaning heavily upon the shoulder of the baker who was going to run for m so the last man who was going to bat uh, was the blacksmith he came with the baker he had a complaint that he could not run so he will took a baker's help as for running the blacksmith lashed the first ball wildly and it tried up into the air to an enormous height the ball went up and up later it seemed motionless in the air like a hawk bird here the author is describing okay the ball stood in the air without any movement okay like a hawk bird then what happened whether the ball will come down or not let us see this was almost disproving the chief invention of sir isaac newton but later slowly it came down as the players could not see the ball it went out of their sight okay everyone thought that it disproved the chief invention of sir isaac newton theory what was sir isaac newton theory the law of gravitation okay as the ball didn't come down they thought that this had proved disproved the law of uh, gravitation but later slowly it came down so when the ball was in air what and all was happening in the field now let us see it will be very enjoying narrations given by the author let us also enjoy firstly the blacksmith forgot his sprained ankle and set out to run for the other end blacksmith was so excited he had completely forgotten that he had brought a baker for running and he himself proceeded to the other end for a run this was a humorous situation which we can say the other end baker was running for the invalid that is for blacksmith also set out and he also roared and said joe to run clear students the blacksmith and the baker ran just like a i stepping acnes acnes means like a horses together they started running towards the other end for a run because they were excited the team the team needed just one run to win the match so they had completely forgotten everything the other and ju called the blacksmith bill to run 
so all the three came on everything would be all right if all three concentrated on their running but all three just stayed only at the ball and had a terrific clash if that was the thing with the batting team now whether the fielding team did their job correctly let us see whether they did or not mr hodge the captain of the scottish fielding team mr hodge after a swift glance at the ascending ball and a swift glance at the disposition of his troops disagreed the emperor napoleon's order napoleon once informed that if there were many people in the war field he would not able to reach his goal but mr hodge disproved didn't agree disagreed the emperor napoleon's order why because he saw all his fielders were so enthusiastic and they were approaching towards the descending ball boon had not bothered about the match especially after the previous incident because the ball had hit his midriff and it caused a lot of pain so he was not worried about the match except him everyone were so excited and they were running to catch the ball mr hodge made a fatal mistake as he saw livingstone and southcourt moving together to catch the ball firstly he initiated livingstone to catch the ball but after remembering he had earlier missed two catches later he said southcourt to catch the ball but what was the big mistake livingstone didn't hear the second order so both livingstone as well as uh, southcourt started approaching to catch the ball then what happened let us see the professor of ballistics had made a lightning calculations there was a professor of ballistics he had made a calculations everything how the person had hit the ball to which density it is moving everything all the calculations the he made and thought ball would land to the northeast of boon thus he was in hurry to stand over there but on his way he collided with donald okay knocking him over so he stumbled on donald and made him to fall down he was in hurry to go and stand there and catch the ball he made a correct calculation that the ball would come and land over towards the northeast of boon clear then what happened later south court tripped over donald the south court who was approaching to catch the ball he also tripped over donald seeing this boon stepped backward and came upon professor sto the wicket keeper whose movements were a positive triumph bumped the professor from behind so everyone are coming and uh, eating each other that's all they are not in a right position to catch the ball clear students okay at last the ball came down the ball leapt on to boon's head and then trickled slowly down the wicket keeper's back and it was foot from the ground where mr shakespeare pola grabbed the ball finally the ball reached the ground but mr shakespeare pola grabbed the ball when it reached the ground so was it declared a no the match was a tie there ended all the uncertainty and disorganization so the match was a tie 
only Mr. Hodge, the youth in the blue jumper and Mr. Pullock knew the ball reached the ground and it was not out. This three knew that the ball did not, uh, the ball reached the ground and it was not out. In this way, the match ended. Neither of the team won the match. Clear students, the match was a tie. Okay. Hope you enjoyed this uh, lesson. Fine. Most frequently asked questions from this lesson. Why didn't Sexton and the postman take a run when it was possible? It was possible for them to take a run. Why didn't take? Because Sexton was a old person, he was cautious. Postman was a government official. He was not ready to take any such risk. Why was Boone angry after catching the ball? Because the ball hit his midriff very badly. What fatal mistake did Hodge make? Mr. Hodge told Livingstone to catch the ball, but again he reversed his decision, which could not be heard by Livingstone. What was Napoleon's dictum? How did Mr. Hodge disagree? with it. Who won the match? Neither of the team. The match ended with a tie. How does the uncertainty and disorganization among the ranks of the invaders add to the humor? All the humorous situations you must write down students. Clear? Understood the lesson? Fine. Now, let us move to the next part that is poetry. The Stolen Boat. The Stolen Boat. This poem is written by her poet William Wordsworth. William Wordsworth is considered one of the greatest poets of English literature. The episode of The Stolen Boat is based on the experience of William Wordsworth's early boyhood days. This poem is the experience of the poet. The poem is about the poet's experience in his early boyhood days. Hope you can see this picture and understand better. Summary of the poem. The stolen boat is a poem associated to one unforgettable occurrence of the poet's boyhood. The poet explains that one summer evening, guided by nature, no one else was there, he found a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cave. The boat was tied in its usual place. The poet went there and untied the boat. Then what happened? He instantly untied the chain of the boat, got into the boat and hoed it away from the shore. It was an act of theft, okay, and his pleasure was mixed with anxiety. He wanted to enjoy his ride, but there were different emotions running in his mind. When the boat moved on, there came a echoing sounds of warning from the mountain sides. So, every, there was a complete silence. So, as uh, the poet's boat was moving, it echoed. There was a echoing sounds of warning from the mountain sides. The poet fixed his destination to her Craggy Ridge, that was his destination. He wanted to take the boat to Craggy Ridge. The poet's lovely boat had a fairy like look. As he was moving, he felt a huge and black peak followed him with a will and a power of its own. So, as he was moving, he thought that black and huge peak was following him. He continued to row, uh, row on and on over the calm lake. 
but slowly growing larger in stature the awful peak with its towering height seemed to stand between the poet and the stars so the poet was not in a peaceful mind to continue his journey with the horse trembling in his hand he reversed his course and moved back silently over the calm surface of the lake to the shelter of the willow tree he could not reach his destination instead he reversed his boat and left the boat where it was sheltered usually the poet tied the boat in its usual place and went back to his home even after several days went by his mind taunted him of uh, stride king side so he couldn't forget what happened so that was striking him for several days most frequently asked questions from this poem what still the act does the poet comment name the two peaks mentioned in the poem huge and black peak that is one thing the another one is craggy ridge how the poet was haunted by a mysterious presence within him you can also expect reference to the context from this poem she was an elfin pinnack she uh, refers to boat okay elfin pinnack means a fairy boat is referring his boat to a fairy boat with trembling oars i turned so he was uh, so much afraid okay it moved back instead of continuing guess journey about that you must write a note clear students hope you all understood this do well in your exams this pariksha vani would uh, will really be fruitful and helpful for you all all the best for your exam students do well okay thank you everyone thanks a lot beeti tore yuva na u pariksha bar yuva ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ ವಾಣಿಯ ನಾವು ನೋಡಿ ಕಲಿಯುವ